Thank you all um, for being here. So today I'll be talking about snakes and spiders, robots and geometry. So my background uh, coming into here is I started off as an undergraduate at MIT in mechanical engineering, uh, mainly focused around design with some controls. From there, I went to Carnegie Mellon uh, where I was in mechanical engineering and then crossed over into robotics. Uh, I spent some time uh, during my PhD uh, over in Japan at one of the national labs in Japan. Uh, before starting a faculty position at Oregon State University, uh, where I uh, moved out here to help found the robotics program. So we started basically from scratch with a uh, big empty uh, building uh, that no one really wanted to be in. And we've renovated it a couple of times. This is after the first renovation. Uh, we were able to uh, build it out, uh, spruce it up and move in there. And we've recently done the second renovation. Uh, uh, so this is actually after, still after the first renovation. Uh, and then we've recently done the second renovation, improving the physical plant even further. Uh, but Julie Adams will be coming out to give a seminar uh, next month. And so I'll leave, uh, leave it to her to give you the full pitch on what we've done with the physical plant. But uh, in the time I've been here, uh, we have over 12 core faculty across a range of areas in physical interactions and autonomous robots. Uh, my own work I've, uh, has been uh, across uh, robotics and uh, mechanical en engineering and biology. I've worked with groups uh, looking at uh, seahorse and snake kinematics. Uh, we had a couple of papers in science based off of that. And I've also worked on uh, locomotion with uh, non-traditional kinematics, including things where we're building fins out of tape measures. I've worked with industry on how to do path planning for putting grinders uh, against uh, large metal objects. So uh, when you cast aircraft engines, uh, you end up having to do a lot of rework on them because they're so, such complex parts. And that's really hard. It's like doing dental, dental work on a giant. And so we're looking at how to do the path planning to uh, alleviate some of that physical load on the uh, grinder operators. I did some work on uh, uh, the mechanics of throwing objects with tethers and then making those tethers wrap around targets uh, and with uh, legged robots. Uh, working here with Jonathan Hurst, uh, who has spun off the uh, Agility Robotics Company. Uh, the, co my, the core thing I'm known for, however, is snake robots. And so uh, during my time in uh, graduate school at Carnegie Mellon, I was working heavily with the kinematics of snake robot chains and looking at how if we um, take a chain of servos and run the right wave pattern through them, we get different, uh, we, we can make the snake sidewind or, sli or slither. And if we slightly change that pattern uh, and still only with bending, no twisting actuators, we're able to uh, create a, a robot gate that climbs up a pole. Uh, here at Oregon State University, I've been working uh, further on snake robots and kinematics. Uh, this is one example here of a pneumatic snake robot that we've built. And so the key thing there is that rather than having coordinated servo motors, we were actually used the mechanical design of the system uh, to force helical motion out of, uh, uh, out of um, McKibben actuators stretched across the whole length of the snake. And so then by cycling those four McKibben actuators, uh, we're able to change the phase of the helix and able to generate that sidewinding motion without um, complicated timing interactions between actuators. Uh, more recently, and at the end of the talk, I'll uh, bring up uh, some work I've done with spiders, looking at how geometry of spider webs affects their sensing and their and how uh, and the ability to locate prey inside a web. Uh, but before I talk about uh, further about any of the research topics, I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about some educational uh, aspects of robotics that I've been uh, working on in my uh, time here at Oregon State. So, uh, one of these at the graduate level is the full stack robotics course that I teach as part of our graduate introductory sequence. And so the idea there is that we're coming is that we have uh, students coming in from a wide range of different disciplines, uh, the core engineering disciplines of mechanical, electrical, and CS, but also coming in from physics or psychology. And we want to make sure that everyone coming through the robotics program 
has the core robotics experience to say that they're, they are a roboticist. And so I've put together a course that in the course of one quarter uh, goes through the fundamental arms and cars paradigms for uh, robotics, uh, make sure that all of the students have individual experience with system setup. So working with mechanical systems and electrical systems and the computer aspects, including securely setting up your, your uh, Linux box that's embedded in your robot. Uh, make sure that they've worked with version control on a, at a significant level. Uh, that they've written code that interacts with the world. So they'll deals with the uncertainty of sensors giving noisy data or needing to be filtered and make sure everyone's had that baseline experience before they go off and start working on more complicated things. And then finally, an understanding for how the paradigm, the paradigm of how information gets passed around between elements of the system. And because the course is very fast, I ended up writing my own uh, Ross Ross mini um, operating system for teaching the idea of information flow across uh, the robots. And so the idea is that it's a lightweight publish and subscribe framework uh, that you can implement in about 300 lines of Python and provides a minimal interface to Python uh, multitasking in a way that's uh, safe. It doesn't do all, get you all the features of it, but it gets you a safe subset of the features of multitasking. Uh, and then uh, has uh, alternative versions as an educational step for looking at the difference between cooperative and um, uh, preemptive multitasking. Uh, and then it's got the core components, uh, it provides a message bus class with read write locks and a consumer producer wrapper class. So you can take any sensor uh, reading code or um, control decision code that you write as part of a um, basic control loop. And uh, during the course, we take we have them first write those basic control loops and then split them out into their individual threads running uh, separately in a published subscribe model. And so this consumer producer class lets us uh, lets them take their code and directly port it into the consumer producer setup. And then for the educational use, there is a, um, we actually have them implement the basic framework uh, and then also go through and use the reference implementation that I have available at rostross.org uh, uh, as a means of um, using a, a more policy system, seeing how uh, what the extra refinements you can do if you take the time beyond a course project are, and then also using this as the, as the baseline step for later pieces of the course where they are doing uh, more complicated projects using uh, uh, this framework as a way of organizing their code without um, having to have the full overhead and a couple of weeks worth of implementing a full ROS installation when you don't actually need that power for the educational purposes. And that power is actually sometimes detrimental because it takes them further away from what they're actually working on, what the actual interactions between their subsystems are. Uh, the other educational thrust that I've been working on is on the geometry of motion. So geometric mechanics using um, uh, geometric reasoning about uh, how physics works, not just about the actual physical motion, but also about the geometry of optimal curves and natural motion that you get under constraints. And so I've been working on this uh, at a couple of levels. So at the undergraduate level, I teach a robots and uh, gyroscopes class. And so in that class, um, I've moved away from anything that's um, handwork, multiplying matrices, doing lots of uh, repeat operations by hand and put the focus more on programming. Uh, and that's been supported by a um, MATLAB grader automatic feedback environment that I've put together that uh, provides both syntax uh, corrections uh, to keep the students uh, moving and uh, where they're not, not as familiar with some of the code syntax, gives, uh, points out um, clearly where their uh, mistakes are with the coding, but then also gives uh, almost to the line feedback on where their data flow went wrong so that they can uh, learn and get rapid feedback and go back and fix their code and fix the relationship between the data objects that they're working with. And so putting the focus on that rather than blind uh, handwork that um, can very often go off the rails and then not be recoverable. This allows for rapid correction and uh, iteration on their learning process. Um, I also have a graduate textbook uh, right now that is on the fundamentals of Lie group uh, differential geometry and Lie group theory as applies uh, specifically as applies to robot kinematics, but also more generally how these um, structures work. Uh, and uh, I have a textbook, uh, and so the textbook is in nearing completion of the draft of the first edition. I have reading groups 
project, uh, working through it now. If anyone is interested in being part of that, please contact me. Uh, one of the key things with this book is compared to other differential geometry or Lie group theory books is that the focus is on the interaction between these mathematical objects and how they fit together in their normal use case rather than looking at proofs and edge cases. And so it's a focus on those, on the relationships between these uh, different mathematical objects. And the exercises like following the same models I used in my undergraduate class are programming focused uh, where there are detailed specifications at the end of each chapter for, uh, uh, for implementing the, uh, for uh, implementing the mathematical objects as Python objects and focusing on the interaction between those objects as a means of um, absorbing the material rather than uh, doing lots of handwork that focuses on the manipulation of, sim of hand manipulation of symbols rather than on the concrete interaction between the objects. So now that I've um, covered some of the educational pieces that I work on, I'd like to shift to the main topic of my talk, which is the a specific geometry of motion that I spend a lot of time thinking about, which is uh, um, locomotion. And so by locomotion, uh, what I'm talking about here is the process by which a system can change shape because that's what uh, the system internally controls. It's got motors and servos, or if it's an animal, it's got uh, muscles and joints. And so, uh, that's what it can control internally. And then by some means of coupling physics with the environment, those shape changes can be turned, turned into position changes. And very often then when we start looking at locomotion, we end up looking at gates. And so those are gonna be cyclic motion changes of shape that are producing uh, a characteristic net displacement over each cycle. And that could be, the gate could be described by the patterns of the footfalls of the legs, or it could be described by uh, the oscillation pattern in the snake uh, and the uh, phase differences and timing between the different bending motions. And then this comes down then, uh, we can describe those more fundamentally as being describing the path period and pacing of a gate. So the path is the distinction between what set of shapes the system follow, uh, passes through as it executes that motion. Uh, period is how long it takes. Is it going slow or is it going fast? And then the pacing is the internal timing. Is it going at a constant speed or is it going fast and slow? And so I'll be using those terms as we go forward as a general description of uh, how we can talk, think about the differences between gates, even if we parameterize them in different ways. Those are all, the parameterizations are all layers on that fundamental path period and pacing geometry. So then uh, once we've uh, defined the, the space of motions we're looking at, we can ask what makes a good gate? And so we can break that down into two pieces, one of which is how much dis displacement does the gate produce? And the second is how much does the gate cost in terms of time or resources to move? And so the general paradigm that I've worked out over the past 15 years uh, that I've been working on this based off of previous work in this field is that locomotion is an, uh, can really be talked about as an area perimeter problem. So your net displacement is area based and your cost of motion is perimeter based. Uh, and then you can extend these ideas. Uh, they have, these ideas then have a natural extension if you go to more than two shape variables of, uh, they, ex they extend naturally to these higher dimensions and then once you have this idea in place, it actually informs, can be used to inform uh, data-driven machine learning approaches to complicated locomotion problems for which the first principle models that uh, I'll use to explain the corporate principle cannot directly be uh, developed, but that uh, the motion of these systems then follows uh, the same principles. And so uh, to ground uh, these statements, I'm, uh, let's look at a constraint-based locomotion model. And so uh, as I'll describe, uh, this model is going to apply to a number of different physical systems, but we'll start off by taking a simple three-link chain. And that three-link chain can be, uh, its configuration is described by the position, uh, in this case of the middle link, and by the angles of the two joints that describe its shape. Uh, now, for a number of physical models, we can write down the physical model as a constraint 
that says that the allowable combinations of body and shape velocities under the, un under the constraint get mapped to a zero vector. So the body velocity here is the forward lateral rotational velocity of the system. And the shape velocity is the rate at which the joint angles are changing. And so as examples of uh, physics models that have this kind of constraint uh, expression, we can start off with the uh, skater, uh, which says that we're gonna put a uh, roller skater uh, uh, wheel on each of those links, such that, the, uh, uh, such that the links cannot move sideways at their center points. They're allowed to freely move forward and backward, but they are not allowed to move sideways. And so then if we build up the constraint matrix as the um, lateral motion rows of the Jacobians for each of the links given the uh, shape and body velocity, then uh, we can say that uh, that constraint matrix always has to map allowable combinations of shape and body velocity to zero. The uh, next class of systems here are free fall systems and inertial swimmers. So if the system is subject to conservation of momentum, uh, and this could also include um, a uh, added mass uh, for a system moving in a, in, a, in a mass heavy, low viscosity fluid. If the system starts at rest, this momentum or momentum-like term uh, always has to stay zero. And so uh, that means that you have a conservation rule that says that you can only have body and shape velocities that map to uh, zero through this inertia matrix. A similar principle shows up for viscous swimmers where the drag on the system from interaction with the surrounding viscous fluid is orders of magnitude larger than any inertial forces. So this includes things like microorganisms uh, where the water viscosity is so much more than any mass in the system. And so those are uh, end up then saying that if you collect all of the forces acting on the body frame, that those net forces have to be zero. The system is in static equilibrium. And so any allowable combination then gives you a zero net force, uh, uh, must give you a zero net force when mapped through the force uh, mapping that uh, pulls back all the forces into the body frame. So once we have a model like this, that's okay for telling us uh, as a test, are these certain combinations of velocities consistent with our physical model? But that doesn't give us a way of going from the input velocity to the output velocity. So we can uh, uh, use some techniques to find the null space uh, uh, complements of, the, of a specified shape velocity. And then that's gonna tell us what the corresponding vo velocity is. So to do that, we can separate out the uh, made, uh, the constraints into the body velocity constraints and the shape velocity constraints. We can pull those over to the, uh, pull all the position components over to one side and then invert that position component, which is, uh, uh, which people ask about this. Uh, this is allowable for the way these uh, constraints are set up. Uh, we're allowed to do uh, that inversion. And then once we have that uh, inverse product there, we can collect all of those together into a single linear mapping that takes us from a, that acts like a Jacobian, taking us from joint angle velocities that we specify to the uh, position velocity that is the null space complement in the constraints. And so this allows us to basically have an input output from uh, known joint angles to induced, uh, known, known joint angle velocities to induced position velocity. And so now let's take a look at the structure of that mapping. So. This is a uh, matrix, uh, takes the form of a matrix that uh, multiplies by the shape velocity. And so we can separate out that matrix into rows. And then we can look at each of those rows individually. And those are each functions of the shape. Uh, so the functions of the joint angle. So we can look at those as being co-vector fields on the shape space. And then those co-vector fields then act as local gradients of position with respect to shape. So uh, if we were then to execute a gate cycle, in this case, a simple sinusoidal oscillation of the joints 90 degrees out of phase, then we'd see that everywhere where the curve is moving along the vector field, then the uh, system is moving positively in the corresponding x, y, or theta direction. And then everywhere where it's uh, moving uh, against the field, it's going negatively in that direction. And everywhere where it's going across the field, it's not moving in that direction. 
And so this tells us then how we can think about what the instantaneous motion is going to be over the cycle, but doesn't yet get us to the net displacement over, over the cycle. And so uh, to do that, we can apply two principles uh, to these vector fields in order to understand the net motion. And the first of these principles is non-conservativity. And so the non-conservativity is telling us that uh, if we have, in this case, a wheel of variable radius, if we roll it uh, forward, shrink it down, roll it backward, and return into its original shape, then it's moved forward relative to its initial position. Uh, it's at its original shape. And that net forward motion corresponds to the combination of how far we moved forward when the wheel was big, uh, minus how much we moved backward while the wheel was small. And we can further say that that uh, difference uh, corresponds to the derivative of the vector field uh, across its uh, direction. So the, it's derivative orthogonal to itself, uh, multiplied by the distance between those two forward and backward motions, so the change in radius, and the amount, the angular sweep by which we rolled. So when we put those together, that then gives us a um, net displacement equal to that area multiplied by the derivative of the, of the vector field. And if we take that uh, and generalize that to vector fields that are uh, more complicated in structure and over arbitrary gate cycles, then that's telling us that we're looking at the area integral over the curl of A. This is standard Stokes theorem, Green's theorem. But we can't directly apply that to our systems because there's also par a parallel parking effect we should consider for systems that translate and rotate. So if we have a system that moves forward uh, by turning the wheels together, this is a basic differential drive car, rotates by turning the wheels against each other, and then uh, rotates the wheels back together, and then uh, rotates the wheels in the opposite direction against each other, we have a gate cycle uh, in which the amount of forward and backward motion we had minus the amount of uh, uh, multiplied by the amount of turning we had up to a small angle approximation, then gives us the net sideways displacement that the car experienced parallel parking. And this is the uh, known as the leap bracket effect. And so we're looking then at uh, saying that there's a, if we take this leap bracket that tells us how, how much turning changes the world direction of forward motion, then we can use that to predict how much um, that displacement we get from, from this parallel parking effect. And if we put them together, we get what's called the curvature displacement formula. And so the curvature displacement formula tells us we can get um, an approximation, uh, we can get uh, for the net displacement as being the uh, curl or exterior derivative of, that, um, of our vector fields plus uh, the uh, Lie bracket across the, between the vector fields, plus some higher order terms. And, uh, due to some, and based on justification I'll touch on in a moment, we can drop those higher order terms in many cases and get a good approximation of the net displacement as being the area integral of this constraint curvature term that combines the uh, curl and the Lie bracket. So the non-conservativity, con non more forward minus backward, uh, plus the Lie bracket parallel parking effect. And so if we apply this to our system here, we see that the uh, uh, applying the curl and Lie bracket operator to those fields, we get a set of functions here, such that when we execute uh, this cyclic gate, we see that the net dis uh, that the gate is clockwise, so negatively encircling a negative region on the X field, and so moves for the system forward. Uh, it is um, uh, enclosing equal positive negative regions on the Y field and the theta field, so it doesn't get any net lateral motion over the cycle and doesn't have any net rotation over the cycle. And so if we put those all together, we can then now start making some strong statements about how we expect gates, uh, the net displacement from the gates to depend on the path that the gate follows. So for instance, if we take a set of circles with incre uh, increasing radius, uh, we, that's going to be enclosing quadratically increasing area over a roughly constant uh, integrand. And so we get roughly quadratic uh, increase in the net displacement as we increase the radius. But as we um, go to bigger circles, 
we're now enclosing some positive region as well as some negative region. So those, those regions are gonna cancel each other out. And so we'll end up then with a diminishing returns, then actually a loss in benefit as we go to bigger gates, we actually get worse displacement per cycle. We can also see that there exists a gate that traces out the zero contour separating the positive and negative regions. And that that uh, cycle there is going to beat any of the circular gates because any of the circular gates are going to necessarily uh, enclose some positive region or miss some negative region. Uh, and so one thing here I'd like to touch on here is that uh, people had uh, looked, at, um, looked at this idea previously. There's a rich history going back to the late 1980s with um, a good chunk of work at uh, Caltech in the 90s and some work at Princeton in the early 2000s. But um, the conclusion of all of those works had been that the error scaling as you got up to bigger and bigger gates was actually going to be too fast to be able to make predictions like this. And so my PhD thesis uh, at Carnegie Mellon, uh, the core of that was realizing that the error scaling that you see here actually depends on the choice of body frame. And so that all of the prior works uh, were choosing the convenient to work with body frame of being attached to a link, either a base link or uh, perhaps slightly better to a middle link of the system. But I found that by working with a body frame that was at something like a center of mass and mean orientation of the links, I was able to get a uh, much better error performance and was able to uh, get out to those large uh, maximum displacement gates with negligible er error between my predicted net displacement and my actual net displacement. And so what turned out here is that you can think of it in terms of error accumulation, that we had a small angle approximation uh, in that Lee bracket parallel parking effects. And the errors in that small angle approximation are what show up in the higher order terms I dropped in order to get my curvature um, uh, formula. And so uh, when I got, uh, and so if we're working in this um, mean orientation center of mass type frame, you can see that the uh, orientation line I'm using for the system barely oscillates. Uh, and the uh, and so there's very little angular uh, displacement. So any small angle approximation is going to be uh, better than if I was attached to the middle link. And additionally, the um, reference point at the center of mass flows smoothly from my start to my end point, it doesn't oscillate very much. And so any translation that I made while at a bad angle would compound into the error in my approximation. And so if I was center link attached, I'd be having this big swooping path with big angular excursions and big position excursions that would build up lots of error. But uh, by choosing the center of mass like uh, frame, then I'm able to minimize the error and then use that constraint curvature to make those predictions. And uh, there's a, um, I could be happy to talk further on the operations here. There's a fundamental uh, decomposition we can apply to the kinematic model in order to find what this best body frame is that minimizes the angular and position excursions as we execute motion. But then moving on from there, we can ask how do we make a fair comparison between gates? So if I have a big, big gate versus a small gate, uh, if I was sitting in front of you, I'd, I'd start walking across the stage doing big lunging steps versus easy strides versus baby steps and say that if I do a per cycle comparison of those, it's not really fair because I, uh, especially with the lunging step, it's very hard for me to execute that at speed. So I'm either putting lots more effort or having to go more fewer cycles per second as I take big lunging steps versus taking strides. And so that appears in uh, across any kind of locomotion. So uh, we need to start looking in terms of efficiency rather than displacement per cycle. And so, there's a couple of ways of looking at the efficiency of a gate motion that correspond to general ideas of cost of transport, but are a little bit more specific on what we're looking at. So the first is that we can fix the average instantaneous cost. So I can say, I'm giving you a power budget of one watt or however much, um, or 10 watts and say, what's the fastest that you can go and, and, then, uh, and then say, what's the displacement per period of the gate. Uh, so if I fix your power, that ex fixes how fast you can move the cycle. And so then I can say, well, what's the period uh, for that gate to turn out to be? Divide the displacement by that period. And that gives me an efficiency measure for which higher efficiency is moving faster for a given effort. 
The second uh, way you can look at efficiency is you could say, well, I want to move at one meter per second. And I need to look then at my displacement per cycle divided by, by my uh, power required to, uh, to move at that one meter per second multiplied by the period of the cycle. So it's my total energy consumption. And this gives you higher efficiency is using less effort to move at a given speed. And for a number of reasons, it works at, um, for the systems I'm talking about here, these work out to be equivalent. Sometimes you need one versus the other, but for the material I'm talking about today, uh, it's uh, much cleaner to look at in terms of uh, fixing your average instantaneous costs and asking what you can do with that power budget rather than asking how efficiently you can move at a speed through the world. And uh, for the, everything I'm gonna show further today, these are equivalent to each other, but it's easier to look at uh, uh, this left-hand side. And so we can then take at the um, cost of the gate as being uh, the time to complete the cycle at a normalized uh, power input. And so uh, this lets us go back to this path uh, pacing and period operation and look at um, how these interact with each other for a gate cycle. So we are saying we're gonna fix the instantaneous effort and this could be something like motor speed or motor force. Uh, so like you can have your tor uh, tor common torque squared um, uh, as your uh, instantaneous cost of motion. You might have a, a velocity squared. So you can put something like this in as your instantaneous effort. And you fix, uh, fix whatever you chose your cost to be at a uh, unit value. Once you've done that, the uh, period for the ex execute, executing the cycle is determined by a um, pa by the path and pacing you choose. Uh, your pacing for any given path, for any given path, there's a unique best pacing you can choose. And so then we can go through and we can choose the path that, that um, gives us the, uh, we can choose the path that gives us a, uh, so once you choose a path, then that determines the period at the best pacing for that path. So we can start then looking at our path uh, and optimizing over these paths. And then we can say, well, how do these um, features depend on, how does the cost and the period depend on uh, your path and pacing? So if we take a basic racetrack path, uh, if we say that there's a V squared cost for moving along the path, your best pacing is going to be to move at constant speed through, throughout the entire path. If you speed up in one section, it's gonna cost you more than slowing down commensurately in another section. And so, uh, your best, uh, best thing to do, like driving on a highway, is to maintain a constant speed. If you look at the acceleration squared as your cost, so this is like motor force, uh, then it turns out that you want to slow down in the corners because you've got that extra change of direction force you need to use in the corners. And then by, because you're averaging out your acceleration means then you want to be moving at a roughly constant acceleration. It's not completely constant, but a roughly constant acceleration. And so speed up and slow down in the uh, straightaways in order to be moving more slowly in the corners and have less acceleration cost for taking the corner at speed. The second principle uh, we can derive is for cost scaling. If I have a set of gates that are uh, uh, the same shape but at different sizes, I can expect my uh, the uh, time to completion uh, to be linearly uh, correlated with the radius because increasing the radius increases the perimeter at a given speed, then that incre linearly increases how long it takes me to complete the cycle. But at a, uh, if I look at the acceleration squared cost, I end up then with a uh, square root gr growth in the time to complete the cycle because the bigger cycle is less curved. And so I can go faster at any given section at the same acceleration. And so uh, that takes the edge off the increase. And so as the cycle gets bigger, I'm actually able to go faster on it uh, and so don't have quite, quite the same growth in uh, time period. Uh, these, uh, for our physical systems, uh, these principles are modified by the idea of shape distances. So if I have a shape that's uh, moving symmetrically like this, that actually costs more in terms of resistance against whatever I'm pushing against in the world than if I was uh, doing an anti-symmetric motion like this, where the links tend to be drawn along their length more easily. So if I have any kind of sideways motion is harder than lengthwise motion, that um, shows up in a difference in cost between those two motions. And so the overall geometry of the shape space ends up looking uh, stretched out like this with symmetric shapes more distant from each other than anti-symmetric shapes. 
Uh, it also turns out then that where I am in the shape space uh, matters. So uh, moving when I'm slightly curled up puts less uh, torque on my joints than moving while I'm more straightened out. And so the overall geometry of the shape space ends up curved. And so we, can, we then transfer all of those um, path growth ideas onto uh, uh, trajectories on curved surfaces rather than on straight surfaces, flat surfaces. And so the effect of curved spaces uh, is that if I have a, a, a positively curved uh, shape, so uh, like a sphere, my period growth with radius is not going to go linear, but it's going to be sublinear because my circle with, uh, as I go further away from the equator, from the pole uh, as my radius, then my uh, circle perimeter grows sublinearly uh, with that distance. And likewise, instead of a square root growth in my period for acceleration cost, I'm going to have a sub square root growth where uh, if I uh, extended a circle all the way out to the equator, then there's no acceleration cost for following the equator. So I could actually, in theory, go as fast as I wanted with no, acceler with, uh, no acceleration cost because all of my acceleration for that circle is directed into the surface where it doesn't cost me anything. If I had a uh, negatively curved space like a saddle, we'd see super linear and super uh, square root uh, growth terms there as the circles got bigger as I went um, uh, further away from the center. But our shape is positively curved, so we'd uh, expect to see that sub quadratic or sub sublinear or sub square root uh, growth. And the final piece we need to consider then is actuator bias. So if I've got a uh, point moving around a racetrack and I'm just applying forces to it, uh, then my force cost is the same as my acceleration cost. And we'd expect to see your optimal pacing to uh, be what we uh, looked at previously uh, with that uh, dips and peaks and moving the same on both straightaways. But if I actually apply that force through a mechanism, I need to consider where the actuators are located on the mechanism. And so that's going to give me a bias uh, away from the ideal point moving piece which in this case is going to say that uh, I'm, I should um, accelerate less aggressively on the far straightaway where I have less leverage from my uh, alpha one torque actuator uh, than on the near straightaway where I have more leverage. So it's going to impose a bias on my optimal gate motion, which is going to move the, um, the, far, the far straightaway is going to have a uh, slower peak speed than the near straightaway. And so all of these are going to show up as layers on top of my uh, basic geometric description of path costs. Uh, but then the, um, uh, we're going to then look at, for any of those, the overall effect of choosing the, uh, uh, of setting up that path cost is that we have something like a surface tension and bending stiffness acting on the, um, uh, acting on the gate that says that it costs to be long and the cost to be cur and there's a cost to be big and there's a cost to be curved. And then that constraint curvature piece was telling us that we should have an outward pressure that's going to be saying we are trying to get bigger and uh, trying to be bigger in order to go further per cycle. And so the optimal gate ends up being an equilibrium between uh, that surface tension from the path cost saying go, be, be a small cycle to ex uh, cycle more frequently and be a big cycle to go further per cycle. And so we end up with an equilibrium point that gives up the, uh, poor, uh, the, uh, the uh, poor yield regions at the edges where those don't contribute very much to the net displacement, but maintains the core rich area at the center. Almost like we're trying to do a area perimeter problem that's build the uh, um, shortest fence that encloses the most rich pasture on a field. And when we do that, we find that the gates, when equal, uh, executed at normalized input, are going to give us a, uh, uh, we get 85% uh, of the net displacement by ex uh, for executing the red gate as compared to the gray gate, but it executes in three quarters of the time. And so uh, overall, we'll give you a faster um, net motion uh, at a given uh, power input. And so this um, idea applies to um, uh, the 2D case that I talked about here. We can boost up to a 3D case 
in which uh, we're, uh, but first by taking the 2D case and saying that this uh, function that I'm looking at here is actually the flux of a field normal to the surface we're looking at. And so we can go to 3D by looking at the uh, flux through a 3D loop uh, in the higher dimensional field. And even though curl, people tell you curl doesn't go up to higher dimensions, the underlying mathematical concept behind curl does go up to higher dimensions. And so we can apply this up to arbitrary large dimensions. Uh, and I'd like to thank then uh, various students who've worked with me on this portion of the work, helped produce the material that cut into that, that built up to there. Uh, I'd like to mention that uh, I have extensions that I believe uh, may have, um, uh, Shai Revson may have uh, talked about uh, in previous visits uh, to your department where we use these ideas to look at um, data-driven uh, approaches where we can actually use the, um, uh, where, where you can actually use uh, these geometric principles to talk about the net um, to uh, guide machine learning approaches to uh, doing gate optimization where we couldn't generate those models. And um, we have to show some of that later, but I did want to touch on the spiders. And so I've had a side project here uh, outside of my locomotion work, looking at the geometry of spider webs and how information flows through the spider webs. And uh, one of those things, things we've, we've been able to do is to build an artificial spider web that uh, uh, we can pluck the web and uh, by using uh, a set of accelerometers uh, on the legs of the spider at the center, we can do a sonar-like operation to identify uh, direction and distance from the hub of the strings that are being plucked. And so this was part of uh, some collaboration with various spider biologists in understanding the mechanisms of webs. And the uh, basic principle it works on is that when you look at a spider web and if I apply a vibration uh, out at the edge of the web, I get a frequency response from the web uh, input to each of the feet uh, of the spider uh, at the center of the web. So if we go back there, I've got the feet number labeled by color. We get a frequency response. And that frequency response, the resonance doesn't give us a lot of information, but if we go between the first two resonances, we can actually see that there's an interesting pattern in which there are nodes uh, in the frequency response uh, that are different frequencies depending on how angularly far the vibration, uh, the vibration source is from the point at which I'm measuring it. And so by looking at these uh, different uh, uh, node, po node points and looking at where they are located at different frequencies, uh, and those are between the first two resonant frequencies, uh, we can actually um, uh, go through and we can find out what the, uh, we can actually process the signals uh, there and back out where the vibration source is coming from based on uh, the different frequency responses the different feet are seeing. Uh, and we're, when we're doing that, we were able to get down to about a second or so uh, of lag time, as you saw in the previous video, between when we plucked it and uh, when we uh, and when we were able to identify the uh, source location. Uh, while I was working on this, uh, when I got the grant, um, I had said, "Hey, this would be a good outreach piece to do a uh, uh, to make a musical instrument out of this. Take it uh, as a performance and call it the Spider Harp." And I got SpiderHarp.com, and I didn't have any, uh, but I didn't yet have any uh, concrete plans for how to work with it. But some of our initial press on this project was picked up by the BBC Science webpage. We made our way to the front of that webpage. And one of my colleagues uh, here in agricultural engineering at OSU uh, saw that, uh, has a PhD in electronic music and came and uh, talked to me and said, hey, your harp would make a great instrument. And I said, well, I got spiderharp.com. Uh, do you want to uh, take it on? And so he did. And he came and he sat down with my student for about a year uh, asking him for faster response times so that he could get uh, something that he could actually play, a musical play music on. And what we found is that if we, uh, rather than doing the full signal processing, uh, that we said, hey, if the, um, all the feet are mirrored around that line of symmetry where we're doing the input. So we actually only just need to look for correlations between the same feet, uh, with the vibrations the same feet are getting. And so that's like uh, turning your head to look at a sound source. Uh, combine that with the matrix turning the ca uh, turning the um, cameras digitally, uh, we can rotate our um, 
uh, we, we can rotate our uh, virtual ear by looking at co the correlation map between the signals that we're picking up at the different feet. And depending on which um, band of the correlation matrix works out right on our time domain signal, we can identify where the vibration source is coming from. And then just use a little bit of extra processing to identify near versus far. Uh, we can put all the strings at the same uh, tension so that the pitch uh, goes up as we go to, as we come into closer uh, sound sources. And then the, uh, uh, and so then we can use that in order to uh, use the carrier frequency to pick out range. And we put that all together and we're, uh, and now have an electronic alternative music, uh, electronic experimental music group called Spider Harp that we were finalists at the Georgia Tech New Musical Instrument Competition in 2019, and then recently played a sold out vineyard show in Corvallis. With that, I'll thank you all for coming and we'd be happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you. Uh, anybody who's in the room, uh, feel free to speak. And anybody who's remote, like yourself or Tom, or you can post in chat. I noticed that. Um, some of the in, during this performance, two of the strings were you being plucked at the same time. So how do you deal with the multiple strings being plucked at the same time? So we're we're actually plucking straight. Uh, we we don't have multiple pluck detection at this point. Uh, we have um, we're, we've looked at that. If we get another round of funding that is compatible with using this as our outreach, we'll probably go into that. Uh, right now, we we can do very close plucks together, but we're identifying one pluck and then the symmetry operation instead of the full signal operation allows us to cut our windowing very short so that we're able to uh, uh, put a couple of different pluck windows very close to each other without having to wait long times for the web to settle, et cetera. Oh, cool. Okay, <laughs> the musician must be really, I mean, it seemed like he was plucking two at the same time, yeah. but. He, he's, he's probably set, setting up one to do the next. And then the just the fact that we're able to, uh, because we know the underlying geometry of how the um, uh, frequency responses work, because we know that underlying geometry, we're able to do a lot of uh, nice signal tricks in order to actually make the decision off a lot less information than you would need to do if you were doing the full signal processing operation. It's very cool. Thank you. Welcome. I have a question. Um, thanks for the cool talk. Uh, Thank you. Have you guys been able to do any quantification of like um, the performance improvement of your trajectory optimization that comes out of leveraging all the geometry um, versus like a sort of naive trajectory optimization that doesn't le leverage the locomotion uh, knowledge? So yeah. So we we've uh, so the. Um, implementation we have, and we have a software implementation you can download if you want to play around with this. Um, uh, we use we take the gradient information that we get from like the gradient of the gate performance, and we feed that over to fmincon, and then run that. And uh, we see we've we've tested uh, fmincon without the gradient information versus fmincon with the gradient information, and we just had to stop the tests because uh, the fmincon with uh, without the gradient information. Uh, if we wanted to do any kind of high resolution gate parameterization, just uh, bog down immediately. But we're able to uh, basically not even go get a coffee time, just click and let it run and almost watch it real time. Uh, 
look at the end, um, do the optimization with 100, get, 100 different gate parameters. And so have you been able to compare that to like a trajectory optimization formulation that doesn't leverage the symmetry of the like locomotion constraints? Because I imagine um, you perform a lot better than that, but I'm just curious if you, if you have numbers on that. I, I don't I don't have numbers on that. So we um, so um, so, yeah, so so the comparison we've done is uh, take the uh, take our um, our raw differential equation for integrating motion over a cycle, mm -hmm. and then feed and then feed to f min con. Uh, just have f min con operate on that. Give it a hundred. Give it fifty or hundred gate parameters, and say f and con um, change those gate parameters. Look only at the um, at the output of what happens there, and run, and that just bogs down immediately. But we can do fifty or hundred parameters with um, on old 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 desktop hardware uh, in um, basically in real uh, in enough time for the program for the for enough time to click it, watch it happen, and and go. Uh, with that, that's uh, for leveraging the like hierarchical period path and pacing structure is, is the what's accounted for that uh partly that and partly that we're able to yeah so we've got the that hierarchical structure helps a lot we're able to uh for the velocity cost we're able to completely decouple it the acceleration cost is trick is a little bit trickier but for the velocity cost uh the uh we can actually write down a cost a version of the cost function that is only based on path so we can say that the perimeter length uh, that there's a uh, uh, the perimeter length under a given metric is going to give us the optimal pacing period for the gate, and so we can actually so we can just operate entirely on 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 path there, and then because we're getting the gradient of performance off of the constraint curvature, we can actually pull that gradient um, as close to analytically as you want. There's some recent work out of Germany that uh, pushes uh, the some of the things I calculate numerically. There's a group out of Germany that. What just went through and wrote up, uh, published a paper in TRO that uh, they actually just wrote down the math for doing it all the way out analytically, and so you could actually, as close to analytically as you want, pull up pull the performance gradients, and then and then that depends on having the good uh, body frame, and so that gets um, that requires a bit of pre computation uh, in order if you're doing it completely right, but. Uh, my student and I just submitted a paper to uh, the ICRA call that is looking at um, good, uh, good approximate implementation. So my original implementation was mean orientation center of mass. You could weight that a little bit, and then um, we just published a better, uh, uh, more in-depth look at weight, or just submitted a more in-depth look at how to do that weighting operation. Cool. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, just a quick question about yeah. Ross Ross. Yeah. Um, how viable is it past like a teaching? Uh, we, a teaching? Uh, I believe the uh, pneumatic snake robots that I'm uh, that we're working with that, that that I showed earlier. I believe that that's using uh, Ross Ross or, or or pieces of Ross Ross in the uh, uh, in in the code for it. So I don't make any guarantees as to scalability. It's still just running a bunch of Python threads. But if you're looking at something to quickly get a project up and running where you want uh, your where you want to have one thread that's um, pulling your sensor, another thread that's control talking to the servos, and then maybe another thread that's using the using your most recent uh, uh, sensor information to tell the servos what they should be targeting, then something like that you could use that as a quick prototype. And then um, I think it, I. Uh, I, I haven't gone through fully on this, but I believe that it should also be a good stepping stone to a full ROS implementation. That if you get something working there and you do need to boost up to something that's got the uh, got got all the higher level uh, pieces to make to make things work at scale, then you could could should be able to boost pieces of it up and transfer them over to ROS nodes. Very cool. Yeah, that was kind of what I was looking for, like something fast prototyping. Yeah. Just like easy to access and then yeah it's easy to access the way way to think about it is basically it lets you set up a block diagram but in but in code so if you think of like a simulate simulating thing where you say i'm going to um uh I've, I've got a process and i want data to come from this point point and then go out to that point uh you take um your basic consumer producer uh is a python object you handed a function 
you had a, um, a delay time between running the function. So it's not trying to do anything hard real time. It's just uh, run the function, delay, uh, run the function again loop. And then you give it a list of your uh, data buses that says uh, uh, your function should, uh, before running the function, pull these data buses and then pass with the con their contents as the input to the function. And then after you run the function, take its output and uh, send it to these data buses. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah. Right. And then, and then the uh, and I think the um, the async I/O version, the cooperative multitasking, is probably safer uh, as you go to bigger things. Uh, as uh, if you if you uh, then the preemptive multitasking, just because the cooperative multitasking is often safer if you take the, if you take the time to set it up. So, uh, so you could look at that. Yeah, I'll definitely check it out. Thanks. Welcome. Thank you. It looks like we are out of time, but uh, let's thank Ross again for this wonderful talk. Thank you for coming.